Okay, I think that's the last few stragglers coming in now, so uh, maybe we'll get started. Um, my name is Ian Houston, and along with Alex Kagoshima here, um, we're going to talk about data science on Cloud Foundry. Um, and something Andrew Clay Schaefer said in his talk uh, this afternoon really resonated with me about we're trying to build a, um, a community of practice. And I think that's really what we're doing here as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we think about doing data science on, on CF. But we'd also really like to hear any input from you, uh, what you've done, what you've tried, what worked, what hasn't worked. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can maybe uh, get involved later. So first of all, who are we? We're both uh, working as data scientists at Pivotal Labs, which is the agile software development arm of Pivotal. And we both actually work in Europe, uh, Alex in Berlin, myself in London. And we've been using Cloud Foundry for the last few years to um, deliver uh, data-driven applications for our customers. And that, what we really do with our customers is we try and work with them to get value out of their data. Maybe just have a quick show of hands. Who here would identify themselves as a data scientist? OK, we've got a few. So it's not maybe as rare as maybe I thought. Um, who works with data scientists or you know, provides services or operations for data scientists? OK, so a lot, a lot more hands are going up. And who doesn't know or has heard the buzzword but doesn't really know what a data scientist is um, and, and wonders why I keep putting those words together? Anyone? Do you all know what data science is? OK, that's great. Really brief recap then, maybe, is to understand you know, what is a data scientist and what is part of their job. Um, so this Venn diagram is famously created by Drew Conway and kind of shows the mix of skills you need to have to be a data scientist. So you need programming skills, definitely, or hacking coding skills. Um, but you also need quite a lot of maths and statistical knowledge. And then to actually apply that to a problem, you need domain knowledge in one area. And when you get the, the intersection of all these three, you get data science and a data scientist. Maybe a different way of saying it is this quote from Josh Wills. It says that a, per, a data scientist is a person who's better at statistics than a software engineer and better at software engineering than a statistician. And the point about this is that you know, we're not really software engineers. We don't have computer science backgrounds in, in the main. Like I have a, a, a physics research background. And some of us have machine learning backgrounds, but we didn't really go through a traditional software engineering um, education. And I think what that means is that something like some a platform like Cloud Foundry is actually really ideal for us because um, we are the people who really don't want to get bogged down in, you know, setting up and configuring servers and maintaining a, and uh, doing operations on them. Because really, we're trying to get a, quickly to business value by understanding data and providing um, some insights. So you know, where software developers in the past had to um, stand up servers themselves and provision and do those kind of things, um, as a data scientist, that is really not my core skill, my core competency. So I want to be out actually doing uh, data science tasks. I don't really want to be doing that. So that's why Cloud Foundry is kind of uh, interesting for us. Briefly, though, what are the type of projects that we actually work on? Um, well, there are a wide variety of them. Here's three sort of simple, uh, straightforward examples. Um, for example, you could be an insurance company that wants to understand the risk. Uh, you have insurable risks, buildings in different places, and maybe you want to understand how natural disasters like earthquakes or flooding um, will affect those buildings. So how much money would you lose if you know, uh, a particular country or a particular region flooded? Um, so we have a client who's trying to do this, and they're trying to uh, run large-scale, uh, very computationally intensive tasks. Um, and what we're trying to do is trying to help them to run that in a parallel way, maybe use in database systems, um, and go from running, you know, maybe being able to run one or 10 of these uh, statistical procedures to being able to run 1,000 or 10,000 of them to get a better understanding and better insight and, in effect, reduce the risk um, that they have. We've heard a lot today about the Internet of Things or the industrial internet. Um, and predictive maintenance would come under that sort of heading. Um, so this is where we have you know, some, some mechanical thing, maybe hard drives, or maybe it's an oil drilling platform. And you're trying to predict when it'll fail, because um, the cost of having that system out of production is very high. So I've heard uh, people have systems with a cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars if it's out for one hour or you know, one day. And if we can predict when those outages might happen, 
we'll be able to either repair them in advance or send the right spare parts that need to be there, or maybe take them out of uh, production and put something else in its place in time that we don't actually get that downtime. So we do that with a, a mixture of you know, large-scale machine learning processes, understanding the, the live data feeds that are coming in from those um, industrial internet applications, and trying to predict and then take action uh, because of that. And then the third one here is understanding your customer. So lots of enterprises and large companies have siloed data where they understand a little bit about their customer over here and another little bit over here, but these never talk to each other. So trying to bring those together, trying to understand your customer from a holistic point of view, and then being able to provide better services, uh, better, better customer uh, in experience because of that. And that's quite a lot of what we do. But there's a lot of other things, for example, like um, trying to reduce fraud in banking, uh, or trying to uh, predict the destination of uh, you know, your uh, journey in a car. And we, we do a lot of these different things, and we want to be able to provide the services we do, the data science services, in a quick and easy way and get to those data-driven apps. So what does a data scientist really need out of a platform, or what sort of infrastructure do they need to, to do their work? Really, I think it boils down to three things. We need somewhere to store data and some e easy way to capture that data. So, for example, in the Internet of Things, the you know, wide variety of different types of data coming in from different devices, we need a way to be able to channel that data somewhere and be able to store it long term and be able to access that easily as well, like not have it in long term storage, which is very hard to get at. Um, for example, I'm working with a client at the moment and we've you know, tried to do a data extract, a very small, relatively small size of data, like it fit in my free Dropbox account, but it took you know, over 24 hours to get that extract out. That was 24 hours we couldn't work on the data. So we need somewhere easy to put data and access it. We need somewhere where we can do large-scale intensive computations, so running at scale with uh, distributed computation systems like Apache Spark or on top of Hadoop, uh, MapReduce Paradigm, that kind of thing. But finally, and this is where we really get to value, we need to be able to um, deliver results, whether that's purely just as you know, a list of results on a web website, or it's a data, a data API where someone can go access it and get um, predictions for different things, and Alex is going to talk a little bit about that. Or it might be simply an interactive uh, sort of uh, data visualization where you're able to explore the data and see what the consequences are. So we need all three of these things. And I'm going to talk about the first one, and then Alex is going to talk about the next two. So I think the first of these is the, the data storage, the how do we get data in and how do we keep it somewhere. And in Cloud Foundry terms, platform terms, these are data services. So we want um, an easy way to get access to these services without me having to go and download you know, Redis myself and install it and try and tune it. I want an easy way to get a key value store and just push things towards it. And I also want uh, to be able to build an application that can actually feed that relatively easily as well. So instead of just getting you know, someone delivering me a hard drive and I have to load it up somewhere uh, with the Internet of Things and other um, you know, online real-time streaming data, we're going to get these streams of data in, and we're going to need to be able to do something with it quickly. So there's kind of a natural way of doing this in CF with data services. So you can have you know, your managed service. Um, you know, there's lots of examples now, and I think we've heard a lot about these today and will tomorrow. But even you know, things like uh, highly available MySQL or Redis or even Rabbit message queue, we want to be able to create them easily, and we want to be able to bind our applications to them as well. But you know, lots of people have dedicated standalone big data infrastructure. You know, they might have their own Hadoop installation, something like an Apache Spark cluster or whatever else. And user-provided user services allow you to connect to those really quickly and easily and enable you to use your existing infrastructure without having to manage it through Cloud Foundry. Now, you may want to get to the point where you manage it and provision it using something like Bosch, but uh, using user-provided services for now gets you to you know, meet that um, distributed data requirement today if your service isn't managed by CF at the moment. And one good way of thinking about this is uh, the ease with which you can switch from a test data store to a real live production data store. And you know, a sort of traditional way of doing this in, in data science, might, you might have to actually go and edit your files and change the way the data flow happens. Here we can just bind to a different service. So I can have 
uh, one app pushed to CF that it's bound to my test uh, Postgres instance, and then I push another app, but I bind that to my production instance, or I switch between the two. So that provides a really easy way of going from one to the other. So that was the data services part. Alex, you're going to talk a little bit about the computation and the, the d delivery of results. Sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, compute part. So um, on the one hand, I'm going to explain a little bit what are the typical challenges uh, uh, when we work on actual customer projects with this and um, show um, the concept of a little prototype we develop. Um, but first of all, um, so as data scientists, um, what we usually do in our work is we obviously we implement code. So some people, they have this image that we stand in front of a whiteboard with a lab code and uh, then code stuff in C or something like that. That's not how it is. So what we use mainly is Python and R. So these are two fairly high level languages. And uh, the reason we use them is because they have really, really good library support for uh, a lot of machine learning algorithms. So these are really our favorite tools. So uh, when Ian and I started out uh, working, um, working on Cloud Foundry, uh, the first thing we found is there's no R build pack. Um, and the Python build pack, which was there, is uh, kind of, mm, let's say, it doesn't really uh, have a lot of the libraries out of the box that we usually need. So what Ian did is he used the Anaconda Python distribution um, by Continuum IO and uh, build his own build pack out of it. And if we use that, there's a lot of stuff like scikit-learn, for example, uh, which is a machine learning library, and we can use that out of the box. So that was, that was very handy. Um, I used a lot of R, uh, especially in university. So I, I'm a big R guy. So what I did is I created a build pack for R, which was kind of challenging. But uh, at some point, I got it done. Um, so these two things were really uh, were really helpful and really essential before we actually could anything could do anything on Cloud Foundry, right? So first thing first, we had the build packs, which was good. Um, so let's let's take a look at uh, at our usual work. So Ian already mentioned briefly what we do is we work as kind of consultants for our customers of the Pivotal Big Data Suite. And uh, what we do there is we kind of try to get some meaningful, uh, valuable information out of big, big data sets. So uh, the way this happens in practice, uh, so we work with a lot of enterprise customers. So you see these siloed data and siloed systems at the customer. And then what we do is we uh, get a big data extract and put all of this in some kind of distributed big data platform which is nowadays usually HDFS, and then we work on top of it with Spark or something else. It could also be Greenplum, uh, some that's an MPP relational database. And um, once we have it there, um, we are happy data scientists. We can see all the data uh, with, with great speed, so we don't need to Ex so we don't need to go through long-running extract processes because these already took place. So we already pushed everything over there. And what we do over there is we develop the actual models. So we uh, think about how can we, for example, let's say for a specific, uh, specific customer predict his lifetime value, for example. Um, we use different statistical models, machine learning models that we train there. So we show a lot of data to that particular algorithm and then that algorithm somehow learns how valuable a customer is. So everything happens over there. But the big problem is actually how do we uh, push this model back here? Because the, the business, they actually need the prediction here in their legacy system landscape, right? So that's, that's actually kind of a big issue. Um, that we face in a lot of our customer engagements. Um, very often, after we created a really fancy model, we created a really great algorithm, and then we show a PowerPoint, but then the model kind of dies in the PowerPoint, is what we say. So nothing, not a lot happens. So this is kind of the issue that we, that we have, and we were looking at some ideas on how to solve that with Cloud Foundry, which leads to... Um, 
uh, roughly two thoughts on how you can actually do data science on Cloud Foundry. So this is just a very rough idea on how we think about this. There are a lot of different variants to it. But um, essentially, so what you can do, uh, let's start here on the right side. What you can do is uh, keep using your big data platform, um, which is good because there's a lot of libraries there. You can use Spark, and you can do the computation on the data in place, which is very good. And you kind of use Cloud Foundry uh, mainly as a visualization thing. So once you have some aggregated results, you, you are able to, to show it to your customer in a web app that you deploy in Cloud Foundry, which is good. Um, the other approach is that um, you actually somehow try to leverage the compute power that's available in Cloud Foundry and use the big data store just for storage. So you don't do any computation in there. Um, yeah, so these are the two different approaches. There's also some variance to it. Let's say you don't want to store the data for some reason, then you can just leave that out and just do some online learning computations up there. So there's different variants to it, but these are the two rough ideas how you could do it. Um, so what we did is we created this prototype um, of a prediction API, we call it. So what we want to do with it is uh, basically have a better way of actually interfacing with other software. So this is actually deployed at uh, dsoncf.cfapps.io. When you go on there, you uh, just get the readme landing page, basically, which tells you how you can send JSON there to, to do stuff with the API. And if you're in the Pivotal organization on GitHub, you, you can actually get the code here. Um, so what does this do? So basically, you have this REST API endpoint, and you can send it a request that says, hey, create me a model, which then creates a model in the back end. Um, that model then uh, is able to ingest data. So you send the data as a JSON uh, blob as well. And it's kicking off some periodic retraining. So in machine learning, there's this notion of training. You show the model a lot of data, and then the model gets smarter and smarter about the data. So uh, this, this framework is actually able to, to do some periodic retraining, saves everything in Redis for now, um, which you can r bind really easily on Cloud Foundry. And then you can also uh, kind of send scoring requests to this API. So you tell it, you, you uh, let it know about the data point, for example, all the transactions of a customer, and then the model gives you a, pr a prediction back on how valuable that customer is, for example. So this is kind of the, the API idea that we have and uh, on, on how we can actually leverage uh, Cloud Foundry for data science. Um, we created this kind of interface, um, which, which means you basically, if you want to create a model in that kind of framework, you have to implement this class interface, which means you need to have a train function, a score function, and a get parameters function. And this is all done in Python. Oh, and by the way, this is using Ian's Python build pack I mentioned previously. So what are some data-driven applications that we did? What, what are some examples on, on our work? So uh, one thing which is really cool, which Ian created, is this uh, Transport for London demo. Um, so what this does is uh, it scrapes a, a live feed of all the disruptions on uh, London streets. And then you can see the current disruptions that are happening. But what it also does is it gives you a prediction on uh, how long these disruptions are going to last. And that is based on historical data. So we, we scrape this data feed, um, store it, um, show it, uh, show the live status, put some predictions in there, and the model also gets periodically retrained uh, on the historical data. And you can, you can access it right there. I think it's fair to say this is like the simplest possible way of using Cloud Foundry. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is a website. this is basically the the right uh, approach that you see here. Another thing that uh, I created uh, with my R build pack is um, an um, we call it insurance demo. So it's basically uh, an insurance data set, and um, uh, this app basically allows you to, to explore the data a little bit. Um, and the, the goal here is to uh, find valuable new customers. And what you can do in this app is try to uh, create some rules manually. 
Um, but also it lets you just train a model that picks out these customers for you and then you can compare the performance of your manual rules and the model. And the model is usually a lot better. And that, that's a, an example of the second one where the computation is actually happening in the Cloud Foundry app itself. Um, so it's not happening on the big data platform. Yes. So the, the it's possible in this case because the data set is really small. Yeah. It's like a megabyte or something like that. <laughs> okay. So these are two examples on uh, data-driven applications we did. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ian again. Yeah. Well, just I think you know these are two public examples. We've done quite a lot of customer work as well where we've used these ideas and we've gone a bit further in those. But what we really want to hear is about the rest of the community and what they're doing. Um, already uh, gone down to the GE booth and heard a little bit about Predix. Um, but there, I'm sure there's a lot of other examples in the community of people where, where people are using Cloud Foundry to not only just display results, but maybe provide data APIs and provide, you know, understand some of the sort of issues we're talking about. So we'd be really happy to hear anything that anyone has to say about that. And we set up this website as a place where you can like, just show examples of how to do these kind of things. Um, you can send us something on that Twitter account. But also, we'd be happy to hear right now if anyone's <laughs> doing any of this, um, or if you have any other questions as well. So. Questions? OK. <laughs> um, well, it well, I think it depends on how much. On the, if you're setting it up internally on your, your own CF instance, you just have to provision it as you will. On the, say on PWS, which is the Pivotal Web Services, and that's cloud-provided Redis. So you keep paying for higher and higher levels, higher and higher tiers um, of service. But you know, I think it goes up for quite a far way at the moment. I mean, Redis isn't really made for uh, the storage of really large amounts. It's uh, in memory. so. Uh, its feature is that it's quick, um, but I mean, for for this uh, prediction API architecture that I showed, uh, this is mainly we think of it as kind of a prototype, proof of concept type of thing, that we eventually also want to hook up to something like Spark, for example. So we can also do uh, batch training on really large data sets. And then what are you using for your ingest? So that's a good that's a good question. So in the example. Alex showed, the ingest is just, again, a REST API that you can um, send data to. For example, we've, uh, well, you've helped build this connected car demo, which is streaming data live back from a car, like a, a widget stuck into your car. And it just hits a HTTP endpoint um, that's provided by a CF app. Um, and then the CF app knows, oh, you've sent some data to me. I'll go store it, and I'll run my uh, you know, machine learning. I'll run my scoring on top of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but you know, there's basically, you know, uh, there was a talk earlier about how uh, CF right now uses HTTP as the transport, but there might there is moves to uh, use also use TCP because that allows you to, uh, or sorry, moves to use other things like MQP and other ways of getting data in because you know the Internet of Things runs on a lot of different protocols, not just HTTP. I think there were some more questions. Yeah, Stay in the front. So, <laughs> I mean, one thing you could uh, think about is, um, so I'm actually using Spark and some customer projects now, uh, and I'm using PySpark. And since the uh, prototype that we wrote, it's written in Python, you could actually easily integrate uh, PySpark with uh, some Spark backend that you have running somewhere. So I think, you know, right now you're using a Spark instance that's separate. You know, it's on your standalone yeah. big data hardware, big data infrastructure. Where I'd like to get to, and I don't know, you know what sort of timescales this is around, I'd like to be able to provision a Spark cluster the same way as I provision today, I can provision a Cassandra cluster in PCF. So I, you know, I can do that all through Cloud Foundry. Maybe Bosch is provisioning Spark, and I can just bind to that. So that would be the ideal thing for me. Like, I don't want to, yeah. you know. I want the minimum amount of fuss for me to get access to something. So it's the difference. You know, we heard Andrew Clay Schaefer talk about a bit about 
you know, the old days of provisioning a web application is you go and request a server and it takes three months and then someone has to set it up. That's kind of still the same for big data infrastructure today um, in many ways, especially for on-premises. It's uh, sometimes even longer than three months. So. <laughs> So, but you know, you can imagine, you know, people obviously spin up AWS and you have Spark living on there. But it, you know, we also have, you know, large bits of kit being moved around. Yeah. So if you can make it easier for people to to start, um, get to get to start their data science work as quickly as possible, and then that's provisioning it through CF or Bosch would be the way I'd see that going. Uh, question there. So that's a good question. I think, you know, I don't think I have a hard and fast rule. I think yeah. the, the way everything is going is to be more distributed rather than, you know, one single um, large VM set. Obviously, there are some overheads, but you have people running large scale machine learning uh, systems purely on top of AWS with all the sort of overhead that that entails. And, you know, they, you know, someone like Netflix is able to run their machine learning pipeline purely on, on that infrastructure without having to go down to bare metal um, at any point. So it's definitely doable. Um, you probably have to be a little bit clever about it because you're not you know, getting 100% of the speed that you would on bare metal. But you're, what you're gaining is the ease to provision and the ease of getting started. Whereas on bare metal, you, know, you have to then be responsible for maintaining all of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, that I would say there's no general rule of thumb that you can apply here. Um, I mean, it also highly depends on the use case that you have. So I would say in general, if you follow that traditional approach where you have one big data extract and you put that somewhere, then I would definitely do that on top of Spark. So not inside of Cloud Foundry, but somewhere where I have the storage and the compute together. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. If the data is streaming in, though, maybe it's a different yeah, if, use case. If the data is streaming in, then it might make sense to deploy some online learning on yeah. Cloud Foundry directly. And I think the other thing to think about is, you know, Cloud Foundry installations may be originally set up for web applications, which don't need large volumes of RAM compared to maybe some machine learning applications. So, for example, on, on the hosted versions, it tends to be like a two gig RAM limit. Um, but, you know, really, I'd want, you know, a lot more memory for if I was to do this, you know, on a, on, as a CF app inside the CF installation. So maybe what you get is, you know, um, resource pools that have much better, uh, I think this is going to be part of Diego if I'm not wrong, someone correct me here, um, you can assign resource pools that have a lot better infrastructure for, you know, a big data computation and let your app pick those when it needs to. So I think that's, you know, it's about how much you give the the application each time. Any more questions? Okay, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much.